Heyo, welcome everyone to episode 24 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this is my co host Dylan from Galactic Battlegrounds. Hey, what's up? This week we're going to dive into an arcade game that has been uh, in my eye for quite a while and I've really been wanting to try and I haven't been able to play it yet because we don't have one in the Minneapolis area, but hopefully we will soon. Um, it's an awesome side scrolling shoot 'em up that has just gorgeous art in it. Uh, this game is called Sky Cursor. Um, if anybody's familiar with that, we're going to talk to Christopher Cruz today about the game. How are you doing today, Chris? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad we could finally get you on here because I know you guys are super busy over there working on a, another game, which we can possibly talk about at the end here or maybe in another episode. Um, but first off, I just want to let people know who Christopher Cruz is. Who are you? What do you do? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, uh, I'm the creative director for Griffin Aerotech and Griffin Aerotech is the team that designed and published Sky Cursor. And so as the art director, I'm accountable for essentially anything visual in the game, but I also handle the sound. Uh, I create a lot of the music, um, create a lot of the packaging for our cabinets, for our products. And, um, I'm also, generally um the key game designer typically i'll come to the team with the concepts and work with uh, the rest of the team to actually see the concepts through um and on my team uh, i have two other core members of the griffin aerotech team uh phil Golobish is our producer and phil's really uh, accountable for all things hardware um so he's actually the one who designs and builds our hardware platforms that our games run on. He's also uh, a very good sort of third eye in the project in terms of he's not the developer, he's not the art guy. He can kind of come in as that third party and and see what we're doing and kind of steer us straight if we start to go off track too far. Um, And then Brad Smith is our technical director, and he's responsible for all things dev. uh, With Sky Cursor, for example, um, that game actually connected to the internet for updates and had a networking system that was all built on the back end. So not only does he develop the games, but he also develops um, some of the operating system pieces that we put together and the the networking and all that. So it's a small team, kind of lean and mean, but uh, we all kind of carry a pretty wide range of of, uh, of skills and and sort of you know things that we're accountable for on the team. Yeah, I love hearing about all these these small indie teams that are coming up and creating these games. I mean, with Galactic Battleground, we're only four. Uh, Cosmotrons is two. Deathball is one. Um, I know uh, Killer Queen started pretty small as well. Um, I want you to jump into the game. Let us know what Sky Cursor is, what the game's all about, what's the purpose, what was the style, um, why, why it's Sky Cursor. Yeah, so Sky Cursor started purely as a sort of labor of love. Um, I think it was Christmas of, gosh, it's been quite a while now, maybe 2014, uh, maybe even earlier. Uh, Phil, one of my my counterparts with Griffin Aerotech, had started to develop a really simple uh, side-scrolling shooter kind of over the holiday break. And he came to me and showed it to me. And, you know, I was like, man, this is cool. You know, like the, the tools for game development were becoming so much more accessible, right. And, and have become even more accessible since. And so, you know, we started talking and I was like, man, why don't we really try to make a a real game here? And so I kind of got the requirements on what, what he was trying to do and started to create some art. And soon we were at a point where, you know, we we're seeing some of the key assets in the game kind of coming together and some basic functionality. And we, re- we really quickly realized that we needed someone with a strong development background to, to kind of help us uh, make this thing actually do what we wanted. So fortunately, we at the time, we were all working at a consultancy, uh, Phil, myself, and Brad Smith, who we pulled in as the... As the uh, the technical director at the time, he was just, it was just for fun. Right. But, but what we ended up building um, over time was the game that became sky cursor. And it's funny because from the very, very moment we started, it was almost like we all knew that 
the only way we were going to make this game was as an arcade game. Like we never talked about, oh, well, we'll make it for PC or we'll make it for, you know, Switch or whatever. Gosh, I don't even know if the Switch existed at that point. But um, it was just a thing because I, I grew up playing arcade games like I was definitely an arcade rat, you know, kind of growing up. I grew up during the sort of 2D fighter resurgence that kind of helped breathe new light life into the arcade at the time, sort of early 90s, late 80s. And so, you know, I, that was just kind of in my blood. And so we took Sky Cursor from that concept. And as soon as we posted a really crude video of the game running on, um, I had an Astro City um, sit down Japanese cabinet, uh, posted some videos of it, and it kind of just took off. And at that time, um, I think the only other sort of indie arcade game that was had any no, no no one knew of at the time anyone knew of at the time was killer queen and uh, so i think there was just sort of this like hey what's what's going on over here with this game and and it kind of took off faster than we could have imagined and so yeah from there we we really started to try to focus in on making the best game we possibly could and you know over time we started selling to locations all over the world um, which was really cool. Uh, big w- way we were able to do that, and that kind of getting into a little bit into the weeds here. But we actually released the game to be able to play on any JAMA compatible pla- uh, arcade cabinet, and JAMA was the standard uh, all through the all the way up to the late '90s, starting at like the er- late '80s. Um, so there, there's a ton of cabinets out there in the wild that you could theoretically play Sky Cursor on. And especially in places like Japan, um, all those sit-down cabinets that they have in Japan are are JAMA compatible. So we were able to ship our game to Japan without having to ship the entire cabinet. And those kinds of games are really popular in Japan. So we did we did fairly well there. And you know, it just kind of one of those things where I think the game was pretty cool. You know, I'm definitely proud of of the project and what we've done with the game. But I think just the fact that it was an arcade exclusive game made by a, by a small team with kind of a really unique art style. Um, you know, we were fortunate, it grabbed a lot of people's attention and, um, you know, it, it sort of set us on the trajectory we're on now where, you know, we're working with, uh, one of the best, you know, indie publishers out there right now to make it, make an arcade game for them. So it's really interesting that you started from the bottom you know, from a Christmas game, and then you start working with these big name companies. For Sky Cursor as a whole, where did you draw the inspiration for, for the art? Like, what did you use, and what kind of styles are you trying to go for? For sure, for sure. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm definitely one of those artists, I think, that I tend to wear my inspirations on my sleeve. You know, it's hard for me to shy away from the stuff that I'm most drawn to. And, And it really does... There was this period, in my opinion, where pixel art kind of reached its pinnacle in terms of of the amount of detail and the fluidity of the animation. And a lot of that was happening uh, during that time I was in the arcade with the Capcom fighters, with the Neo Geo and the MVS that was there um, in the arcade at the time. You kind of had you know, some of the best art in video games period in the history of video games happening in the pixel art format. So that, that Japanese style, 16 bit, late 16 bit style, where they were really kind of pushing the boundaries of the hardware. That's always been my inspiration. I I won't claim that I've gotten to that point with my art, but it's certainly um, what I draw the most inspiration from. And, you know, it's one of those things um, especially when I look across, you know, games that are coming out now today, um, where you don't see a whole lot of that happening anymore. Um, there are certainly a games that kind of carry the torch for that style, but with Sky Cursor, it was definitely looking at games like, you know, of course, Metal Slug, but even going back a little bit further from that team, what I found is a lot of those pixel artists that worked on some of my favorite games, like uh, Street Fighter Three Third Strike, um, for example they actually worked on Metal Slug and they worked on games before that. Uh, There was a game called In the Hunt, which is published by Irem as an arcade game that was sort of the precursor to Metal Slug. And some of that slightly older style has like even more of a chunkiness to it that uh, was really appealing to me. So 
I really referenced those games a lot. In fact, a lot of times I would, uh, I would get, you know, lossless screenshots from the game, right. And pull them into Photoshop and kind of just stare at them, um, at the pixel level and just try to understand, you know, the way that they built their shapes and, and sort of how they went about creating the art that they had in those games. Because even today, there are certain elements, especially in the backgrounds of some of the Street Fighter games and, and uh, you know, Metal Slug 3, for example, which has unbelievable backgrounds where I still don't quite understand how they did it. It's definitely pixel art, but there's certainly an element of, um, I think, some computer assisted components like they were maybe using soft brushes and some blending techniques that were still palette restricted. So it still maintained the pixel art feel, but if you try to do it just dot by dot, I just can't imagine that someone went in and, and dotted all that out. They, they very well could have, but, but um, that's something I could talk about for days, man. <laughs> um, I, you know, uh, with most things I can get going and, and I won't stop. But with that specifically, that, that art style is just so fascinating to me. And it's like, you can look at a still screenshot of those games and it's, it's incredible. And then you see it in motion and it's just like, oh my God, like the, the animation is also like, I mean, it's like Disney quality. Some of the stuff that they were doing with the stretch and pull and the, you know, the way they would key out frames that just to really give things, especially in street fighter, just like incredible impact and weight and gravitas, you know, those, those games, um, I just, I, I'm obsessed with the art quality in those games. And it's definitely a, a big motivator as I put, you know, the things that I do, together for the games that we're making that's really awesome to hear and i'm glad that you know street fighter is like a beautiful game especially the 16-bit like just it looks like anime at its finest honestly Mm -hmm. um so when you were making the game and you know doing all this art what were some of the issues you ran into and what advice would you give to any designer slash artist that is trying to make video games Oh man, you know, it's funny is I think one of the issues that I ran into that it was just our first game, right? Like we came from, um, you know, like you said, right? Like we just came from doing something just a, as a, uh, you know, just a cool way to pass the time. And we got more attention than I think we were even expecting and, and we're even ready for in a lot of ways. And there were so many things along the way that we learned, uh, some of them we learned the hard way, but one of the things that was a real challenge for me, uh, was that I got substantially better from the first pieces of pixel art I, I created for the game to when we were starting to get to the point where we were wrapping things up so much so that I actually went back and redrew, um, huge sections of the game. And also, I think I just started to get to the point where I was tweaking things almost just obsessively and maybe not to the the overall benefit of the game. So one of the things I would probably say for anyone who is, you know, considering making a pixel art game, whether it be for the art or for the arcade or for another platform is, you know, kind of come up with your 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 style and the approach you want to take for the game. And, and work through that style for a little while before you really start to commit anything to the game. That way you can kind of make sure that, you know, you're comfortable with the, si- the style, that um, at things are cohesive in terms of what you're trying to do. And it's working with sort of, you know, your animation style and all that, just to prevent kind of the situation I got myself into where I sort of just started going at it and then develop my style as I went and then had to go back and, and, and fix a bunch of stuff, you know? And then the other bit is you have to remember that, especially for an indie team, you know, I think, um, there is, you know, people, you get passionate about what you're doing, but I think there are certain times where it's okay to let things, you know, sort of be what they are as long as it's not impacting the game and in a negative way, right? Like, yeah, you may want to go in and dither a certain section of the sky better or whatever the hell, but at the end of the day, is that as important as, you know, some other piece that's going to actually impact the game um, in a meaningful way? And also, you know, with all that said, you know, kind of knowing when to let go and say, this is doing what it's intended to do and I can leave it be right. Cause 
you know, I know I'm sure folks who get into pixel art get into pixel art because they're detail oriented and they want to do something that's very methodical and sort of, you know, very detailed. And I think with that kind of mindset, sometimes you can really grind yourself down into a pulp, right? Just like refining, refining, refining. So sometimes I think it's good to know when to say that's enough. That's serving the purpose that I originally intended and I can move on um, to another section of the game or, you know, finish the game. Um, that was something that I, I struggled a lot with. And, you know, it would be would have been good to kind of know what I know now uh, as I was working through Sky Cursor. Yeah, I, I think that's some pretty good advice for, for new developers to just just figure it out be comfortable with it and then work into the game and, and go the direction that you want to go with and just stick with it. Um, and I love the art that you put on the game. Like the cabinet is beautiful. The, the side art is awesome. The game is just gorgeous. Um, but I want to talk about even with that is the different options you guys have for buying the game. You kind of mentioned it before that they're all like JAMA compatible. Um, but what drove you guys to go with multiple different options for purchasing the game and what is the advantage for you as the seller to have those different options? Um, I think, you know, for us, um, we kind of saw, and this actually played out for us, uh, what we, what we thought might happen. It actually seemed to, to happen, um, just about as we, we kind of hoped it would, but you know, there's a lot of new arcades opening up and a lot of these, um, arcade operators that, you know, arcade owners will go out and buy a bunch of older, you know, games, which is awesome. You know, they have all the nostalgia and some of those games are absolutely timeless. But then there's a lot of these JAMA cabs floating around that were never really a quote unquote dedicated game, right? They were just sort of a shell that you could put your, you know, whatever JAMA compatible game you wanted to run in into that cabinet and a lot of those games um you know there's so many jama games out there and it's not like a lot of those don't carry maybe the same amount of nostalgia as something like a donkey kong or you know uh, some of the classics and so all that is to say in a really roundabout way is i i we saw an opportunity for uh arcade operators and arcade owners to say hey, if you've got a JAMA cab that you don't have a great game for or you're looking for something that you can market as a brand new game on your floor, uh, with Sky Cursor, all you have to do is buy the hardware and the, and the, um, the art to you know, uh, decorate the cabinet and you've got a brand new game. And you don't have to commit to buying you know, a $5,000 game. You can spend $8,000 and have um, a game that's ready to earn your money back, you know, fairly quickly. I think there was a location in Japan that earned the money back within like a week of the game being on the floor, uh, which is pretty incredible, right? Like that's a that's a great return on the investment, just yeah, on the business a, side. It's a really fast return. Yeah, and, and the markets there obviously is completely different, but um, but yeah, it's it's just you know it was just a way for us to make the game more accessible and we would have never been able to ship the game across the, the world like we did it, had we not had that option. Um, I will say that it, it was a double-edged sword, though, uh, because um, a lot of, especially like pure arcade operators that have like multiple locations that they're just, you know, putting things out there and seeing what sticks, they don't really... And it sounds pretty bad, but it's the truth. They don't really care very much. So like they would buy the art package and slap it on like the worst cabinet they had and like not do a good job, like, you know, catering the art to the cabinet or, you know, they could have even worked with us and we would customize art a lot of times. And you would see sort of the art versions of our game out there in the wild. And they kind of, especially on the art side, just made me almost want to cry because it was like they were just, they weren't kind of, you know, putting any effort into presenting the game in a nice way. Right. Whereas when you're building the fully dedicated cabinets, which we had as well, and we still have, um, you, you have complete control, right? Like you, you can make sure that everything is exactly to the specifications that is best served for the game. So for us, it was just really, um, a way to address what we saw as a gap out there. And it also gave us a platform to publish other games. We helped another um, uh, independent developer 
published a game called Rashlander um, that we actually had no part in developing the software, but we were actually able to take our platform um, and publish the game with our platform. And, and he was able to get his cap, his game into lots of cabinets out there in the wild, because again, it, you know, folks didn't have to purchase the whole cabinet. They could just pur- purchase the the hardware to run the game and the, the, you know, the conversion kit, as what the industry calls it and get the game out there and and be able to run it that way. So um, going forward, you know, if I had my way, I probably would try to do dedicated cabinets as much as possible because I think that whole art experience is a big part, you know, like what you guys have done right with your cabinet. Um, it, It all plays a part in the experience and, when you can have control over it on the art side, I think it makes a big impact. But I will also say that I I know we wouldn't be, uh, you know, in as many locations uh, internationally had it not been for that approach with the, with the JAMA kit. So it it worked out well for us. And it was really, again, just a way for us to create some options for folks who were interested, but maybe were a little bit weary of committing, you know, to buying a whole dedicated cabinet and paying for the shipping and all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I completely agree with you on the the art direction and the the ambiance of the cabinet, and I can I mean, as you were just telling that story, I could just see coin operators just putting the art on crooked on the sides and just cutting off different portions of it because they they just did it real quick to get it out as fast as possible. Um, but you're right. I mean, having that control is big, um, and you've told us a lot of little snippets of stories about these international cabinets. And I'm curious as to if you guys have any fun stories about like how you got to France or how you got to Japan, because that seems kind of outlandish for a lot of small indie developers that are selling a cabinet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, you know, a big part of it was the fact that we we um, we had the option of uh, of you know being able to purchase the kit as opposed to a full cabinet. Right, the shipping <clears throat> is more more reasonable, and the and the overall cost is is less, but you know, it was funny for the first, um, I think it was the, for the first six months we were selling the game, we were only selling it to, uh, confirmed arcade locations. So it had to be a public arcade and it had to be a business. And that period was, was really awesome because it was a business to business transaction, right? Like they knew that, uh, what they were dealing with, right? They, 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 the game was there to kind of draw in a crowd and, and it was a great experience for us because, you know, we, we could get feedback from the arcade operators and sort of understand what was working and what wasn't and sort of built the game out to, to kind of meet the expectations. We did multiple updates during that time and sort of that beta phase. Um, and, and that really, we got coverage on a lot of, um, arcade specific websites. There was a guy, there's a guy named Adam Pratt, who's a, just a great, great guy in the industry he runs a website called arcade heroes. Yeah. Um, we've met him at a couple conventions. With yeah. Black Battleground. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a really good guy. And he's obviously very, very passionate about the arcade and he runs an arcade in Utah. He was uh, one of our very first buyers um, out there in, in his, in his arcade. Um, but you know, we just, we were lucky. We got, uh, picked up in a lot of places on the media and folks would just reach out to buy. But, but I will say that a funny story was when we, when we opened sales to the general public, we did it through our website and we just did pre-orders and then we would, uh, had a delivery date after we opened up the pre-orders. I think it was like 90 days after we opened the pre-orders and we just got flooded, uh, with orders from private collectors. And that was really hard because a private collector, it's a different kind of buyer. Um, it's a different set of expectations. And the other challenge was we had to, we had to also, you know, do the technical sort of service for these games. Right. And you never knew, you know, we would be trying to do a technical service call with someone in Germany on a completely different time zone. It's like 10 o'clock at night for us. And it's like daytime for them. Or sometimes it was like one in the morning and we're trying to help and they can't speak English. I have no idea what kind of cabinet they're trying to run the game on, but they're saying something isn't working. Like it was (laughs) for, you know, when you're making a game, the last thing you think you're going to be doing, you know, as an art director is trying to like have a, have a chat online with somebody who's, 
trying to get the game working in their house, you know, and God knows what super gun or whatever they've got it connected to. And it's just like, Oh man, that, that was, uh, that was really hard to be completely honest. Like as cool as it was to have so many folks interested in the game. Um, it was, it was just like, it was backbreaking to support that many folks out there in the wild that, um, you know, again, you know, it's all these different formats they're running the game on different power. You know, it was, it was really, really wild. Um, and it was definitely like, we, we, we had some growing pains during that period for sure. So that's, that sucks that you had to go through all that with all like the, you know, language barrier, but it's still awesome to hear that, you know, you guys did really well going, you know, overseas and doing all this cool stuff with the kits. Um, I'm going to go back to the art realm and how like, people applied it and stuff, but um, <clears throat> what program do you use for your design slash art? And have you used any other ones besides the one that you use mainly? Yeah, yeah. So um, to, to make all the art for all the games that I've worked on up, up to this point, I, I do use Photoshop. But what I do is I turn all the sort of Photoshop features off, essentially. And it pretty, pretty much becomes a bitmap editor with an animation timeline and the layers. Um, there's also a, a really cool, um, I, I uh, was just thinking about this the other day. I don't use it much anymore, but there's an option that um, it's kind of a, a cool thing that um, pixel artists have discovered in Photoshop. And I think the guy's original name, the, the original guy that kind of wrote the article about his name is Dan Fessler but it's called index painting. And it's essentially a way of using some of the brush tools and, and sort of uh, blending tools and things like that that are available in Photoshop, but keeping the palette restricted, like the old deluxe paint and things like that, where a lot of folks would actually make pixel art back in the day. Um, and it's a pretty cool tool because you can do things like use gradients and use like soft brushes it's really good for things like clouds and like some of the softer stuff where you're trying to add textures. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and you can manage the palette. Uh, for anybody who's kind of curious, I would go just look for index painting and maybe I think it's Dan Fessler. Um, and he actually provides a template for you to download and check it out. But, but I'm going down a tangent there. But, but, but Photoshop for me, it just serves the purpose of what I'm trying to do. And it's also um, the workflow I'm most comfortable with. So I, for me, when it comes to the art side, you kind of don't want the tools to get in your way, right? Like you want to be able to flow as as smoothly as you possibly can. And, and Photoshop provides that for me just because I'm so uh, comfortable with it now. But a lot of my art, especially when it comes to character animation, I use a similar technique to uh, what Capcom used back in the day where I'll actually uh, draw the, the character animations on um, actual paper with pencil and ink and uh, get the animations working well on the paper and then um, scan those, those images in and use the, that line work as the basis for the pixel art. Um, I found that for certain curves and to keep sort of things fluid and flowing that technique for me personally works better because a lot of my pixel art is at a very large scale. Um, right. Like a lot of my sprites are, are, you know, half screen sprites, right. Where they're just giant, giant sprites. And so yeah. to get those animated nice and smoothly, um, I find that it's it's better for me to start on paper where I can kind of get my arms moving and, and get a little bit more flowy um, with the with the art. And then then when it's time to color it and refine it with the pixel art, um, that's when I can get down into the details. So I'll just use like a simple um, pen line drawing, scan that in and then essentially trace over the line work and then go in and color it and add all the the pixel art you know, to, to that. And I found that workflow, especially again, for larger character animation type work. Um, it really helps me, you know, create a very lively animation style. I like that. That's, that's a lot of insight for someone that's just starting to get into it. Um, 
And I had no idea that Cop- or Capcom went with paper first and then scanned it. That, that's that's a really cool concept for how they did the motion. It makes sense as to why it's so clean. Like, and it's very know. anime, you know. And, and, right. and yeah, yeah. And a lot of those guys they they would hire from uh, animation background, um, so it makes sense. But yeah, it's just it's just you know, I think anything that can help you with the process. Another thing I do a lot of is I use. Um, Google SketchUp, which is a very simple 3D modeling pl- uh, program. And what I'll do is I'll use that to create models of, uh, especially with technical objects like guns or, you know, cars or tanks or things like that, create simple 3D models. And then you can pose those models in whatever way you want and actually take those 3D models and use them as the basis of the art. Like, right. Like I won't actually use any of the actual model and the art, but I might bring that model into Photoshop and then trace over it with the pixel art at the right scale. And, and I can have a lot of confidence that if the object is rotating in space, for example, it's actually a 3d object rotating in space that I'm drawing over. And it just, it's another way of just kind of giving your artwork more credibility because you're, you're, you're referencing you know, a, an actual 3D object, right? And it's, I, I've used that technique for quite a few things where it's, you know, a really complex rotation animation or something like that uh, with something technical. I, I'll, I'll use that technique from time time to time. Awesome. I'm wondering what you guys are working on at Griffin Aerotech right now, because at this point, Sky Cursor is done, right? I mean, it's, it's a complete game. It's being sold to the public. Yes, it, it is being sold to the public. We we have um, we have some ideas uh, going forward uh, for updates to Sky Cursor, and um, our idea is that if we do update it, those updates would be free <clears throat> to anyone who's purchased the game uh, in the arcade. Uh, so so I I don't know if I would say the game is is completely done, but it's certainly um, full featured at this point. Right, it has the full. Uh, four levels and it has an ending and it has kind of a a full flow scoring system and all that's in place. Um, But we, we've uh, we have shifted our attention um, to a project that we're working on with devolver digital um, and a company called dodge roll. And we're working on an arcade version of uh, the game, enter the gungeon, which is um, one of devolvers most successful games of all time. And uh, it's uh, we're going to do a light gun game. Uh, so a light gun, it's a completely new game set in the Enter, Enter the Gungeon sort of universe. And we're working closely with Devolver and Dodge Roll on that project. But Griffin Aerotech is actually the team that's developing the project. We're handling all the arcade hardware side of it and all that good stuff. And um, it's very exciting. Um, I will say that, you know, the the sort of marketing gravitas and, and just sort of, you know, exposure that Devolver can bring uh, to a little team like us is, is pretty incredible. And um, they're very good about taking really good care of their developers. And uh, I feel like they're, they're, you know, um, they just, they just take care of the people that work for them. And they're just, it's been an incredible experience we got to show the game in a very early state at PAX East just before uh, the coronavirus hit. And um, we actually had a, a line, uh, a four hour line every day at PAX. We had to close off the line every day because the line to wait to play was so long. And um, Devolver had built us this incredible stage um, to showcase the game and had it kind of as a centerpiece of, of the, of this huge booth and, and uh, thing they put together for us. It was just, it was an amazing experience, but unfortunately, you know, coronavirus hit and has, has kind of slowed um, all everything arcade down quite a bit, but we're hoping that, um, that we will be releasing that game very, very early 2021. Um, we actually are already taking pre-orders and it's been pretty incredible to see um, even still today, you know, when, when, uh, with the lockdown that their arcades are still buying the game on pre-order, uh, just based on the excitement, I think of, of, uh, what we've, you know, are trying to do with the, the Gungeon sort of universe and, and just the built-in fan base with it being such a hugely, uh, popular game that I think a lot of folks are, are thinking it's going to do well in the arcade and it's, it's pretty exciting. 
I love to hear that uh, a studio like Devolver is is so invested in a, a small indie team and they want everybody to grow. So just to wrap everything up here, um, I want you to shout out all the social medias, Chris, for both Sky Cursor, uh, Griffin Aerotech, and the new Enter the Gungeon game. Yeah, yeah. So um, you could find uh, anything Sky, Sky Cursor just at Sky Cursor, right? Uh, there's Twitter, Instagram. Um, we're, we, are, we have kind of taken a back seat <laughs> on social media just because we are so, uh, you know, with all the excitement of the project we're working on, um, with, uh, enter the gungeon, it's also a tremendous amount of work and we're really looking to, uh, devolver to, to help us market it. So we, we don't really have a dedicated social media channel for, for that game. Um, that'll just be all flowing through devolver. But if you, you know, if you're not following devolver yet today, I would strongly suggest it. I, I cannot overstate, uh, how amazing they've been to work with. And I gotta be completely honest. It's a, it's a huge uh, risk uh, for a publisher like Devolver to take on a new arcade game in 2020, right? Like that's just completely insane. But I think they're just so cool about taking risks and they kind of believed in what we were doing. It's just really, really exciting. So I would, I would say follow Devolver on whatever channel, <laughs> whatever social platform you're most comfortable with because they're, they're awesome and they've always got cool stuff to share. Awesome. I just want to thank you again for coming on, Chris. Um, and I want anyone that's listening that is enjoying the podcast, um, if you're on YouTube, to subscribe, hit that like button, give us a comment. Let us know what you think about Sky Cursor, if you've played, uh, what you liked, and what arcade you wanted in, as well as if you prefer to listen to this on a podcast platform or are listening to it on a podcast platform, to hit that subscribe button and share it with your friends so that we can get the word out about this awesome game and Hopefully we'll see the new Enter the Gungeon coming soon. Um, But until next time, I just want to say thank you and peace.